Okay, Facebook and world, do you see me? Ben says he sees me. Hi, this is Greg Salmieri. I am coming to you guys from the Angel Pub in London, where the uh, London Ayn Rand meetup meets. And uh, they're behind the camera here, so you can't see them. But you guys all want to say hi to Facebook? Hi. hi. Yeah, we've got a pretty good group. How many, how many people are we here about? 17, it looks like we're 17 people here, which is a nice turnout. And um, I don't know, how many do we have a number of people viewing live, Ben? Okay, so, my, yeah, my, um, that means that my um, version of the uh, app, the, the app that tells us, uh, we have an app that we use to see comments and things. And that means that mine isn't working. So Ben, I'm going to have to rely on you to uh, to know uh, who's commenting because I can't see that. Well, I do I do see Anne comment that I can see that on my iPhone. Um, all right. So we're having a supplemental discussion today of Francisco Danconia's money speech, and we're in a, a room full of people here who uh, aren't all of us. Uh, not sure if anyone here is reading along with the project um, uh, on a week by week basis. Um, and there are a few people who haven't read Atlas at all, so we're just going to talk about the money speech today as a self-contained uh, self item. And when we have our next session on um, a week from Tuesday, we're going to talk about the chapter of, of Atlas that the speech occurs in, that is part two, chapter two, and we'll talk about the speech there, um, in addition to other things, as a kind of event in the novel. It's an important event in, in some of the characters' lives. It's how um, Francisco and Reardon get to know each other a little bit better, and uh, it, you know, it has some plot significance. So we'll talk about it uh, in that context when we have our meeting on the chapter. But now we're going to talk about it as a, uh, a little work of philosophy in its own right, and indeed it's, it's published uh, as an excerpt uh, in For the New Intellectual, where it's called... Um, where it's called... Um, the meaning of money. I see Will, who's uh, usually with uh, usually with us in New York, just posted that we should start in a, a hard rock objectivist band and call it Reardon Metal, which should be kind of clever. Okay, so it's good to see some of my uh, some of my New York uh, friends are with us uh, with us remotely. Okay, so I want to start off uh, talking about about the speech and. I think it's it's not a secret that Francisco here is speaking for Rand, that she agrees with the content of the speech. But since this is part of the Atlas Project, um, let's think of this as Francisco speaking rather than Rand speaking, even though um, even though he speaks for her. So the context for this, right, is we have the the phrase it's in the Bible: the uh, love of money is the root of all evil, right? It's um, it's Ben, what do you have? It's Timothy, what is it, Ben? Do you know it offhand? Anyway, it's, it's a biblical passage. The, the, what the biblical reference is for the uh, money is the root of all evil, or the love of money is the root of all evil. I think it's Timothy 16. Anyway, it's a Bible passage. And we're at a, a wedding, and somebody, um, somebody uh, you know, mentions this casually. Timothy 6.10, for anyone uh, who wants to check up the Bible. On this, uh, and Francisco responds, arguing that the money money is the root of all good, or beginning the speech with a bunch of kind of rhetorical questions about uh, about it. Will asks if anybody knows the original Greek. Um, I can read some Greek, but I don't know don't know that passage. If, if anyone wants to pull it up, uh, we can talk about it. Or Will, if you want to quote the Greek into the chat, we can see if we can. Uh, make any headway on it. Anyway, and we've got, I think we have some Greeks with us too. So. Um, so what is Francisco's response? He asks us to look for the root of money, right? And asks, is that the thing you call evil? So what is it that Francisco thinks is the root of money? Does anyone here want to come in with thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, the whole speech is not about money so much as the value that it's ascribed to it, so it's only evil to those that have, I hate that word, evil notions on how to use it. It's 
It's uh -huh. not so much about money, but what we can do with it. Though. Okay, I good. Guess I infer that. Let me just ask Ben if they're hearing you, so I have to know if I have to repeat your dialogue. Sure. Ben, are, are Okay, so she, what, um, what's your name, Peter? Mamona. Mamona. So Mamona is saying, uh, uh, she to speak, what he's really talking about is not so much money as the way people use it and how they view it. Is that right? Yeah. And um, so you really can't call money good or evil, but different approaches to money or different ways of thinking about and using money might be good or evil. Correct. Right. Physical manifestation of our desires. It, money's a physical manifestation of our desires. In, in the economic sense. Yes. Uh, I think there's there's a lot of truth to that, um, and he does talk about what kind of people will view money as evil, and um, situations in which someone's pursued over use of money might be evil, but I don't think he has the idea that money is a totally neutral item that can be used well or ill. And they're equally uses of money. I mean, it's, it's, I think he has the idea that there's a particular way of living or behaving that money is the symbol of and that um, money only exists because there's this way of living and behaving. And that that way of living and behaving, he evaluates as good. And yet he thinks there are also misuses of money or perversions of money or people who, if some people weren't living in this proper way with money, then there wouldn't be money at all. Um, and yet, when there are people living that way, um, there can be other people who approach money in a different and, and uh, not good manner. At least that's, I think, how Francisco's viewing it. I agree, though I think at the same time I could extend that notion to state that Francisco is not like Dagny in that he himself is inept in how he physically lives out his philosophy. What I mean by that is even though he never sleeps with the play girls that he brings on the ship and nobody knows that's the case because the newspapers say uh -huh. it isn't the case, he still plays the game like society does in order to seem to use money in that evil way. Even though he's using it uh -huh. previously for more rational terms in the future, he's inept in a way Dagny isn't. So he's more holistic in his approach. You're absolutely right. I completely agree with what you're saying. He he understands money can be used badly and well because he's also good and bad. Unlike Dagny, he's not he's too scared to be himself completely. So we're in a in a spot where um, in the where we're not I know, sorry. Yeah. No, no, but you're saying it's fine. Uh, but we're, we're not uh, giving spoilers, so I, I don't think what you did is a spoiler. But um, if I were to answer it, as I might, yeah, yeah, yeah. if we were offline, I would be giving spoilers. So she's saying that um, Francisco himself, unlike Dagny, is a mixed character who is um, using his money some of the times in good and productive ways, and other times, I guess, for show and ostentation. But it's also good and productive and, because it has a root to it. Um, yeah, so there's a, a kind of complexity to his character that um, you have to think of when we're, we're thinking about where this perspective on money is coming from. And I think that's right, especially when you read it in the context of the novel. Um, now, exactly, part of the context of the novel is that his character is mysterious, right? The other characters particularly Reardon and Daphne, don't get him and what's going on and how can you live like this yeah. and yet talk like that and how do they fit together. And I think all we can say about that aspect of it at this point is to note that there's that mystery and contradiction because to say much more about it would be to give away, uh, give away where we're going. Um, but what is, let me come back with, in light of this, thinking about what, what does Francisco see as the root of money? If you think money's evil, well, let me ask you what the root of money is. Yeah, did you want to come on? Uh, Brent. Brent, hi. Um, so, you know what, talk up, if you guys wouldn't mind talking loudly, it might be that we'll pick you up on the mic, and if not, I'll repeat. And Ben, let me know if you're hearing them or not. Brent, yeah. So, in Francisco's view, before you could have money, you have to be inside of some kind of society where people are willing to trade with each other uh -huh. their productive efforts. Mm -hmm. So, the money doesn't exist until people already produce something. And something that they produce becomes money because it's easy to divide up. Everybody wants it. It can be used later on. Uh, it has long-term value. Uh -huh. So they need. it has to have a society of people willing to produce things 
the tree before you can actually have money. Good. Ben, are you hearing that? Or should I repeat it? All right. Will, what's your name? Sorry. Sorry? Brent. Brent. So Brent is saying that the idea that Francisco has is before you can have money, there needs to be a society. In the society, people need to be producing things. Other people need to want some of the things that some of the people are producing and so forth. And then you have exchange going on. And money only exists in a... Um, money only exists in the context of an exchange society, uh, an exchange society where people are producing the things to exchange. And uh, I think that's definitely how Francisco sees it. Money is, um, money is a medium of exchange, it's a tool of trade, and it's specifically a tool by which we trade our products. And um, Ben actually, um, uh, I, I wish he was here. He came up with a lesson plan for this, which he shared with me for this speech once when he, um, I guess it wasn't a lesson, it was a, there used to be something called the Objectivist Club Network, where they, they were trying to foster a lot of uh, clubs to discuss, well, like you guys do here in London, but they were trying to create resources to help people start up clubs, and uh, Ben and some other people wrote these kind of lesson plans for About them. And one of them, and he wrote one for the money speech, which he shared with me, and maybe we, we can post, uh, post that for people online who want to look at some of the questions. Um, and one of the questions that I thought was really interesting is, imagine if you were a caveman in a society of cavemen, and you came across a big cache of dollar bills, or even of gold. Would it do you any good? No. Would you guys want it? No, it would be no use to you, right? There's no, I mean, the gold would be shiny, and that's nice. And if you figured out how to melt it and do things, maybe you can make some jewelry out of it. But um, cavemen aren't even up to that, so to speak. And you would have nothing to do with it. it wouldn't, you wouldn't have greed for it or lust for it, and you wouldn't be helped by it. Because what? The, the money in your pocket, as Francisco puts it, the dollars, which should have been gold, and we'll talk later about why, you know, Francisco thinks we should be on a, a gold standard, but that money is, um, is uh, how does he put it, your wallet is, a, is your statement of hope that somewhere in the world around you there are men who will not default on the moral principle which is the root of money. And what is that moral principle? It's the moral principle of producing the items that human beings need to live and flourish and then exchanging them with one another. And only insofar as there are people doing that and doing it on enough of a scale that we're not just bartering, but are able to have a, you know, need and have a medium of exchange. Uh, is there even such a thing as money? The paper or the nuggets of gold or coins, doubloons, whatever, um, wouldn't be money in this absent that context. And that's why I think Francisco doesn't see it as um, whether money, in a sense I think it's right that he thinks whether money's good or bad depends on how it's used. But he thinks there's a right use of it, and that right use of it is good, and money only exists at all because there are some people somewhere doing using it in that right way. If there was no one no anywhere using it in that right, if there was no one producing and exchanging, then the paper or the coins wouldn't be money, they'd just be some stuff. Um, so whatever misuses or bad uses or wrong uses or evil ways there are of being with money, thinks Francisco, are parasitic upon um, a certain way of life, which is the way of life that money comes out of, and that's the way of life of production and trade. And so he's asking then, is that what you guys think is evil, if you're going around saying money's the root of all evil? And I mean, I think it's a rhetorical question to which the answer is supposed to be, no, that's good. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead. Not to give away, as, as you inferred, uh -huh. not everybody's read the book, but I think <clears throat> he himself doesn't even realize it when he does this speech that he's flawed in that assumption too, particularly since when he goes into the endeavor of doing what he needs to do, sorry uh -huh. for sounding as cryptic Mysterious, as yes. Yeah, um, he uses the most important thing of value along the way. And he, by that I mean a person. Uh -huh, personal value. So when he adheres that money doesn't, like I completely agree with everything uh -huh. you said, but he's also hypocritical in his stance because he himself is blindsided by the fact that he doesn't listen to his own speech, in a way. 
Well, so that's what Reardon says to him, right? He says, why don't you practice what you preach right after the speech? And um, Francisco says, you know, are you sure that I don't? So whether or not um, Francisco is practicing what he preaches, whether he's living up to the speech, and what it would really mean in practice to live up to the speech, is one of these questions that kind of unfolds over parts two and three of the book. Um, I'm guessing from some of the things you're saying that I have a somewhat, you have a somewhat different view than mine of what's ultimately driving Francisco and what it would mean to be fully consistent with this speech. But let's discuss that offline, so to speak, because we don't want to, uh, we don't want to tip everyone else off of that. But it is a really good question. And, um, a really interesting point of what it would mean to follow through with this, what it would mean in areas of life other than financial transactions, because you're talking about some of the personal values that are at stake for Francisco. And there are later speeches about that, right? There's a speech about the meaning of sex and... Um, I think this, this speech is written in it entirely because meaning, how you spend your money, how you said it, how you said it can be seen in a productive sense there's a myriad of ways that money can be executed but uh-huh. ultimately down to your ego and your morality and that's a path that you apply in each aspect of your life so it's this this particular speech is relevant for all aspects of your life not just financial yeah because the idea of trade i think is relevant to all aspects of your yeah, life we trade emotions as well. yes um so she's saying that that there's emotional yeah, trade as well as um material trade and i think one of the the points of atlas is it as a novel is it pushes us to kind of interrelate these things. So at this point in the novel with this speech, we are focusing on financial trade, but one of the things that's going to happen um, for both Reardon and Francisco is there's going to be a lot, and badly too, a lot of thinking about, well, how does how we behave in business and how we behave in our personal lives uh, relate and how should they relate and um, are there principles that apply to both areas and maybe a little bit of a different way. So we've we've started out with Francisco, here's somebody damning money as the root of all evil. He then says, yeah, but have you looked to the root of money? And the root of money is this kind of life of production and trade. Um, And is that something you damn as evil? Isn't that good? But there's even a further root behind that, right? What What is the root of production for Francisco? Ego. Yeah, come on. Ego we have, and other, and I think that's Depending on exactly how we yeah, need sorry, ego, um, no, but please, no, do call up. But yeah, other, other, the mind, the mind, and I think um, <clears throat> you know people mean by ego somewhat different things, but the mind uh, is one of the meanings, the rational mind, like the ability to think, identity, identity, you to say, to have a trade or something like that, to have a trade, yeah, I but so think about what it is to have a trade, right, because. If there's something you do, you're a blacksmith, or um, there are different ways you can think of being a blacksmith. So like later on in the speech, um, Francisco talks about the time when most of the wealth was produced by slaves, right? And he talked about the slaves, um, and this isn't meant to be a negative comment on the slaves, but on the system of slavery, right? Right. the slaves were repeating unthinkingly um, motions that had to be discovered by someone's mind a long time ago. And I think the reason why the slaves had to be do it, doing it unthinkingly is that when you're in this kind of position of servitude, you're not in a position to come up with new ways and think about ways to do things and so forth. You're just, you know, all somebody could do with a whip at your back lashing you is tell you do this motion, right? Not come up with a better way to farm. So, um, uh, you could imagine, uh, putting aside that the, though that the slaves were forced and whipped and such into doing this, what they were doing was going through some motions that yielded some, that resulted in some products, and the same generation after generation. And if you think of, someone might think of a trade as like that. I don't think it's the right way to think of one. But you could think of a trade as some routine you learn to go through and at the end of it you've got horseshoes i think in that self-esteem of having a trade not the uh-huh. just a, not the objective of having a trade but the self-esteem that comes 
What surnames are based on? So who you are is based on your trait. Uh, and our surnames are based on them often, Smith and such. Um, is it the distinction between a job and a career? What you're doing for now to uh -huh. for your dreams or your purpose? Um, I so think, you? yeah, we're here. Um, I think that's a bit, I'm just worrying about, um, no, I'm, I'm, so I would prefer to have a lot of cross-talk and back-and-forth discussion. I just want to make sure enough of it's being captured. If, if I'm the only one people could hear, then I have to come in between each of you and, and summarize what you said. But if we're hearing enough of everybody else, then we can let the discussion kind of range like it's doing, which I like. Ben, how, how are we hearing, uh, hearing everyone here? He's asking his colleague whether his colleague can hear me. Hello, Ben. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so long as you guys aren't talking over each other, if one person talks and then we have a second on the next one. Um, so, so what's been said is we had the idea that um, we had the idea of uh, of trade, um, and uh, I was asking what's the root of even production, and um, I'm not sure if this is meant to be an answer to that in particular, but it is a significant point that people have trades, that their trades are a big part of who they are. Um, I then made the distinction, um, because I was thinking about this issue of, of for instance, the view of what's the root even of production, of there are different ways you could think of a trade, and you might think of it as a kind of routine you go through. I need, and then I do this, and then I do that, and then there's some bread at the end. Um, and uh, you do the same thing time after time that you learn from someone else. Um, I'm sorry, I forget your name again. It was an M. Mamona. Mamona. Um, Mamona said maybe this gets at the distinction between a trade and a career. Sorry, a job yeah, and a, a career. Job and a career. So right. one infers what you've got to do and one what you love to do. She so says, yeah, a job is what you got to do and a career is what you love to do. And Rand uh, talked about um, the difference between a job man and a, a career man and a job holder in, a, in an essay at one point. And there is this what you just think of as a short term, you do this to bring the money in versus a career is over time and you're thinking about it and how to grow it. Um, and and you had made a point about self-esteem coming from your trade. Right. I think the, uh -huh. the, the uh, gentleman here was not referring to having a trade as the root of production, but having the satisfaction of life that comes from successfully executing a trade as being that uh, root of production, which would be true whether it was money or barter involved. Well, there was that, the self-esteem. Uh -huh. But it's also like um, the sense of a trade, like a identity, like a person who's a thatcher, a person who's uh, a, a, a black... Uh, uh, so right. So, I mean, so many of our names. Smith, Thatcher. My name is, is Salmieri, which, you know, there are all these places, Salmieria in Italy, they're like delicatessen, so I'm sure somewhere back my people were grand delis. And, um, yeah, so a lot of our surnames come from Korea, and it, that speaks to how important someone's trade is if they're in a trade. Um, so, the distinction I was drawing when I was talking about um, the slaves and how you might think of a skill that a slave executed or someone who is in a slavish manner, even if they're free, uh, executing it, just repeating the motions um, as the slaves were forced to do. Um, when we talk about somebody having a trade, though, that's not usually what we mean, right? We mean somebody who's thoughtful about the thing, who's learned, who understands who knows, who's thinking about ways to improve it. And um, if you think of your trade that way, you have understanding about this thing, and you're going to try to get better at it over time and so forth. Um, that is uh, quite a different thing than just, this is the motions you go through. And that's when we think of it more as a career. And I think that's also when a sense of identity comes with it more, personal identity. And I think it is significant that, and self-esteem, that most of these trade surnames, right, are, um, oh, see, now I'm in England, so the words, I was going to say, are middle class. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, are bourgeois, but it is the same, actually. Your, your middle class is better than our Americanized ones for, for this point. But, I mean, you don't have, there's no one, People aren't often named Joe Farmer, right? It's like it's Smith, it's um, 
it's uh, Baker. what Cooper. Baker yeah. Cooper. Yeah, it's things that were, you know, in it in the town. Most people were farmers, and there was one guy who made the barrels, right? And he was, you know, Cooper. Um, and it's it's coming up in a time. These are their names that were for more middle class, more um, artisans, basically. Uh, when you have a more complex and specialized division of labor. And you see that in, in Taylor, uh, Will is, is pointing out. Um, you see that even in, in Greece, in ancient Greece, right? A lot of the early thinking about reason, and um, the Francisco's point is that reason is the root of production. But a lot of the early thinking about reason, particularly if you read like the Socratic dialogues of Plato, the paradigm cases of reasoning that they're using as examples of what it looks like to have a developed, working, thought-out knowledge of something are what the Greeks called technai, um, uh, you know, where we get our word technology from, arts or crafts, things like medicine, things like um, uh, baking could be one, not if, if there was someone who was, you know, more, not what every person would do in their house, but specialized kind of baking. Um, um, metalwork. metalwork and Smith is you know a really good example of it there, and um, it's significant that those are you know exercises of reason, and it's an interesting um, sideline in the history of thought the way that artisans and craft people were thought of, and the way in which that type of use of reason was it at once in, in early Greek thought kind of modeled for what reasoning was like for the early philosophers, but also not really valorized in the way other types of reasoning uh, was. And I think that kind of dichotomy between recognizing that there's something kind of significant about this kind of thinking that we can use it as a model for other kinds of thinking, um, of a lot of people thinking it was significant about themselves and their community thinking it was significant about them. He's the Cooper that we now name people for it and the kind of self-esteem that people take in that, all of that kind of stuff. And yet, that um, it was still for a very long time, and maybe still is, not given the kind of um, moral status or uh, valorized or honored um, in the way that I think Francisco thinks it should be, and that Rand certainly thinks it should be. And you can even see that, I mean, here, that it's the British use of middle class it is um, is significant. Everyone knows, like, it, it, in America, you wouldn't call someone who was like really wealthy and uh, um, owned a, a business middle class. You would call him upper class, probably, right? Mm -hmm. But um, in here, upper class means aristocracy, and middle class means someone who's wealthy through trade, right? It's like um, the the words, at least as I get the British use, the yeah, words, middle class, middle class, yeah, middle class, but in, in in America it's, it tends to just mean socio-economic uh, status and, you know, whether you dress and speak well, whereas um, uh, to call something middle class is to say it's a bit posh, I think, mm -hmm. here still. But I can that's use because posh. this country is older and deals in subtext in more. Yes, it's because it's, I think it's largely because it's older and because it has a tradition of aristocracy, right? And if you, but to think about what that tradition is, I mean, if you read a Jane Austen novel, someone's got an uncle in trade. Um, it's, you know, the guy might be the wealthiest one in the family and so forth, and he might be in a slave, but there's something, it's not the elevated way to be. Um, there's this more, a view of a more elevated way to be that's somehow disconnected from trade and commerce. And that's, I think, um, we don't, we have less of that, I think, in America than there is, um, or at least was, in, in Britain. But it's still a, we still in America, I think, have the idea that there's not nobility associated with, um, and, and I think all over the world, really, there's not nobility associated with being an industrialist, being a banker. It's, you know, maybe seen as, you know, good on you that you made a lot of money, maybe it's seen as socially useful, but it's not valorized in the way that, say, being an artist might be. Well, it is, but in a Protestant work ethic, I don't know why the uh -huh. Protestants got credit for that, but, I mean, the, the idea of having a strong work, work ethic is certainly, um, uh, you know, something that's considered extremely valuable and, mm -hmm. and very well respected by, especially, you know, if not the wider population families, you know, uh -huh. the breadwinner is always the leader of the family. Now, I want to 
try and cut to the, the real issue here. Um, I don't think there's anybody here or even on, online who believes that money itself is evil. Mm -hmm. And what the Bible talks about is the love of money, which means Good. greed. And greed is something that can happen even without money. If you have a barter economy, you can still have greedy people that are doing things, you know, storing up too much grain and it goes all moldy and then all of a sudden, you know, that's a bad thing. Now, that's not necessarily the kind, you know, love has 20 definitions, so there's a lot of different ways to be greedy, some of which are good, some of which are bad. Mm -hmm. I think people who are very um, adamant about amassing wealth by producing more and more, and that's definitely mm -hmm. good. Um, people who are trying to amass wealth because they want to use it to manipulate uh, society to their own nefarious ends, that's bad. Um, so, uh, so that sounds like, uh, uh, just go, or, go ahead. You, I just think that um, in a barter economy, one's greed would be more visible to the population. Exactly, and greed is well, more with, evil. With money, your, your greed can be more covered. One, Actually, one, of, one of the reasons that I think that... You could be bartering gold, though, right? Like, oh? you could be bartering gold for chickens, and then you could barter up a large pile of gold. And then you wouldn't be very, wouldn't be very visible, necessarily, if gold was very valuable. So, well, it's easier for greed to be evil. Do you want to do on this? I, yeah, I, I mean, don't can, I, can I just interject around uh, Tom Burroughs? Um, it seems to me that the, 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 the root of all evil play that's made against money is, to no. some, it's, some, it's, directed, it's directed, as you say, against greed, but it's also the, 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 it's directed against the idea of having material consumption at all. It's an ascetic um, thing. It's, it's, it's an attack on the idea of, of pleasure, of, 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 of prosperity, full stop. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, you see this in uh, the more sort of extreme sort of religious uh, rejections of uh, of this in sort of the very ascetic sort of ethic, the idea of giving to everything up, or living a very basic and simple life. You have seen after this often is congruent with a very authoritarian view of society generally. So I think that the when, when the root of all evil um, condemnation of, of money that comes from the Bible has often been taken up by sort of those with point of view who are hostile or wish to impose some kind of aesthetic um, uh, model on society. And so, for me, one of the, the, the powers of uh, the, the Francisco speech, and indeed the brand's general philosophy, is that it just points out that money is part of a, um, because it's grounded in production and grounded in human flourishing and, and, and the rest of it, is, is, is very much opposed to that. The money is yeah. just uh, in many ways an outward um, epiphenomenon of what that's about. And I think it's really significant that I'll look at you in just a, that the, the Bible is not a given that it's a biblical passage is not a, a pro-productivity work. right? We can talk about the Protestant work ethic but if we talk about Jesus right, in the Sermon on the Mount you know, it's not he that plants that giveth the increase uh, but God, which of you by taking thought could add one cubit to your stature? Um, uh, it uh, take no thought for the morrow. Uh, consider the leaves in the field. They reap not, nor do they sow. Uh, yet, n you know, nobody's adorned as finely as them. And the birds of the air, they don't plant and so forth. Or as the, you sow, right. so shall you reap. Yeah, so and there's as you sow. Those so, who do not provide for the community mm -hmm. won't make it through the sheep and the goats, the final judgment. Okay. So what is the... On the, the Testament. The Old Testament is different from the New Testament. Well, that's both of them. There's more productivity stuff in the Old Testament. Uh, I think you know, that we're getting the idea that there's uh, a difference between the Old and the New Testament. Will is, is pointing out that the cheesemakers are blessed, but that's a Monty Python <laughs> reference. So, uh, not actual, uh, not the actual Bible. Uh, Jesus meant dairy workers in general. Um, for those who know, uh, the life of Brian. Anyway, um, the... So... What, what, well, let me just get on, on this point. There is a, there is, I think, a consistent respect in which the New Testament, at least, is warning us about a certain attitude towards production that you could have, um, which is one in which you take pride in having been able to uh, create conditions of prosperity for yourself on Earth. Now, um, you know, where in fact, um, 
it's God that's responsible for those things if, uh, if, if you are successful, rather than you primarily, and where um, uh, being focused on them, at least as I understand the New Testament, is, is uh, a sign that you are trying to store up treasures on earth rather than in heaven. I think if I'm right about that, that's consistent with it still saying there are activities like reaping that you have to engage in in order to sow. And I think that's also a metaphor, right? Because it's, it's as you behave, so shall things be behaved towards you. Well, the motivation behind that, of course, is that the reli any religion tries to perpetuate itself, whether it's Judeo uh -huh. Christian or Buddhism or Shinto or whatever. It's it's going to have these things that you're supposed to follow, and one of them is to feel guilty about not perpetuating the religion as much uh -huh. as, as if you were not more wealthy or focused on other focused on the religion more. Uh -huh. I don't think you can say that the philosophy of Jesus taken apart from the situation of the religion is is any more or less positive towards production than than anything in the Old Testament or any other ethical perpetuation of you know scripture in any religious tradition well it's it's let's rather than uh, so I got both of you I've got to get to um, and I want to, you know, quickly, rather than compare it to, um, you know, the, the Hindu Vedas or the Old Testament or something, I, I think just in the, the Christian teachings, which are a big part of our culture, right, there is this um, skepticism of a life of production and trade, uh, which there also is in Greek philosophy, right? Um, and so it's in, it's in a number of different places. And I think it's significant that uh, Rand is really departing from that. And Francisco in the money speech is departing from that. And so I take Tom's he point. Provided um, solace for the slaves of the Roman Empire. He provided solace to the slaves of the Roman Empire. So, yeah, so you're saying Christianity um, was, it's a kind of Nietzschean point, right? That it was a morality for the slaves that gives them solace. And that might be right. Um, that's certainly Nietzsche's view. But it's not limited to uh, idea systems um, that were popular among slaves, that um, a life of trade isn't valorized. So it's not valorized by the Greeks, by the Greeks who were all aristocrats and had time to write about this stuff, uh, or by the Roman emperors. I mean, not all the Greeks were aristocrats, but only the ones who were, do we have their books. Um, so you would, uh, let's do in this order? Uh, sure, cheers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to make, perhaps it, it's now a slightly more serious discussion, but a point about the moral value of money, or the moral value of contributing to money here, uh, and like a, a nation of money being a, a good nation, a sort of uh -huh. morally upright nation. It, it seems that sort of in any complex society, there has to be a, a method of exchange. So for instance, in the Soviet Union, before its collapse, you know, people were, people were effectively paid, quote unquote, in the Soviets, rubles and kopecks, and they, which they went to sort of government-owned stores with their ration books and so on. So they uh -huh. had versions of money there, and then uh -huh. pretty much every society, even in slave societies, gosh, I mean, the slaves are being, what were the slaves being traded for most of the time? Money, you know? Uh -huh. So uh, I, I, I can see, like, the, the very, the, a, bare, a, a bare section of the point insofar as we need some form of production for there to be money with which you can trade it. Mm -hmm. And the valorization of a society which has money or values money is a, is a, is a good society. I mean, it, it doesn't really seem to operate, really, uh -huh. if, if, you look at, if you look at the world in general, just... Yeah, it doesn't seem to Well, since all societies have money, you're saying we can't say the ones with it are good and the ones without it are no. bad. No matter how bad they are, they seem to have it. No. Um, I yeah. think I would agree with him partially and then uh -huh. disagree with him completely. Because just based on the conversation, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to denigrate anyone's No, it's no, just no, a no, funny, it's a funny expression. I'm going to I'm agree saying, partially um, and disagree. In the same way that this article um, talks about money and not really, it's more the ego or the personal or the production, whatever way you want to infer it in. Uh -huh. Religion is also moot because it's expressed through that person's ego. There's religious people who are pious indoors that don't denigrate anyone else for their beliefs and live good moral lives. And there are those that, you know, little children. It's relative to individuals, nothing more. So the only marker we have, as you said, just to regurg just to regurgitate the point, you can't really judge all societies with money is good, essentially, and there are societies like indigenous ones that don't use that sort of method at all and live utterly amazing lives in that regard. But having stated that, I'm saying that 
There's no such thing of good, as good or bad greed, there's good and bad people. So when you apply that in a production sense, those that rise to the top by investing in the only power there is, and that's human capital, mm -hmm. then you get all the money, all the people, all the trust, everything you need to climb to it. If you're gonna be like Enron and embezzle the fuck out of your company, then I'm sorry. You're not in Ayn Rand's classification as a moral human being. Money is nothing, religion, ideology is nothing without the moral path of your own endeavors leading you there. At least that's my assertion. Anyone can denigrate it. Absolutely. So the I I can I, no 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 the the idea that I mean this is verges into what, what Francisco goes on to say about money being a tool that won't replace you as the driver mm -hmm. and so where you're taking it and, and, and how you form your desires and your motives are um, is really significant. So let's move to that point but before we do move to that point I just want to Ben uh, in my ear pointed out something um, that I think is really interesting relative to actually things both of you said which is that we do get an example in Atlas Shrugged of a society that doesn't use money, namely Starnsville, right? And this is, um, uh, let me see, I guess this doesn't give away spoilers because like, we don't put it in context. There's a, um, there's a, uh, at one point, two of the characters, I can think of it, at one point, Dagny and Reardon visit a town that um, had been an industrial town, but things have gone really badly there, and it's kind of, Devolved considerably, and people are subsistence farming and so forth there. <coughs> and, excuse me. <coughs> and they're doing. Um, they don't have money, and and Reardon offers to pay somebody to uh, help him with something, and he looks at the money like, what What can I do with this? You know, we just exchange stuff among ourselves, and uh, well, how do you trade with people from other towns? And the guy says, there are no other towns. Uh, you know, I mean, there are somewhere, but not that we can access. And Ben's also mentioning hyperinflated currencies like in Zimbabwe, um, where you know they effectively don't have money. I should apologize for sniffling and coughing. By the way, um, a man can't be expected to do his to be his best when he has a cold, as one of the characters from Atlas says. Um, okay, um, but let's move on to this idea that. Um, so I, mean, I think there's a, a respect in which. Francisco would, re um, so well, I want to come back later to this issue of, well, almost all societies have money, so we can't say that they have money makes them good. And also people use money well or badly, and so there is a respect in which money counts as is neutral, and it's what you do with it or how you incorporate it into your life that's good or bad. But I, I think there's still a point that he would want to insist on that it's not strictly neutral. It's something that has a proper use that only can exist at all insofar as there are some people doing the proper things that give rise to it. And then there's a whole lot of perver perverting of it. And the, the facts that give rise to the proper use of it and that therefore condition its very existence um, also have implications for what will happen when people use it improperly. And he thinks money in some way acts as its own avenger. It, it gets back at societies and people who use it wrongly. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about that coming up. But the, the way to, to get, I mean, but the, the key to this point is just if nobody was producing, then there wouldn't be any money. And if producing is good, is moral, is right, is uh, producing and trading is central to a human way of life and it's part of what's good then um, money is something good it's a, a creature of that good way of living though it can um, be used in ways that are inconsistent with that so it's sort of like the idea of you know when people talk about gun, gun laws or gun control um, and let's not have a debate about whether, whether you know, there should be what, what the gun laws ought to be or not. But you sometimes get a point made by people who are um, defenders of, of more gun rights, more, you know, you should have more gun, 
Well, you know, a gun is just like an object. You could kill somebody with a toaster or a, a toothpick, and yet, you know, why do we treat guns as any different? And, I mean, I think that's a weird and a strange argument. A gun is something that exists in order to kill. And it's made and has all the features it does in order to enable it to perform this function. Now, of course, there are other things you can do with it. And there are other things that aren't made to be objects, tools for killing that you could kill with. But part of what a gun is, and to understand a gun, and to understand why some people want them and why some people don't want them to have them, and you know all the issues about guns, you have to understand that this is a device that is has a certain function, is made for that function and adapted to it, and then you know, can be used in lots of different ways given that. Likewise for money, it's something that exists for a certain function, came to be for a certain function, is a creature of that function, but of course could also be used in different ways and other things could be used to perform its function instead of it. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, stating those two analogies that you just did, mm -hmm. why do you assert that gun is a tool and abide no morality to it, but then money you say is good essentially because it can be used for good oh, as I well don't, as bad. I don't, or maybe I infer that. I, yeah, I, I don't say there's no morality one way or the other. I think they're both, the point I was making is they're both tools. Okay. And Sorry, they're both tools for a particular purpose. <clears throat> if that purpose turns out to be good or bad, then they'll be essentially good or essentially bad. Now, I think the, the, the essential thing for which money is a tool is a good thing. Um, the essential thing, which is a life of production and trade, the essential thing for which guns are a tool, I think, is is neither good or bad. They're a tool for killing, which is usually bad, but good in some cases when people are killing you. But well, why do you set that to guns and not money, then? Why do you say money is good because it can be used for good things as well as bad, but why negate that for guns? It's the same thing. They're both tools. So the issue is, what is the essential thing that this is a tool for? Yeah, guns and can be used to a, kill and defend. Though. Yeah, it depends on the moral justice. Silly, but, but I'm not. A gun could be a tool to shoot your window to get in if you look. No, I know, but that's just the analogy, but, I mean, right? So I, I think, think we're we're, we're all question agreeing question that there are I good. I'm being pedantic about one detail. I think we would all agree that there are good uses and bad uses for both guns and money. Um, but and and this might be a more controversial example than the point, so it might be a poor example. But the the purpose for which, if you want to say what is the essential purpose of, of the thing, the thing that it's always being used for, and any other purpose is a, a weird or perverse use of it, right? I think the purpose of a gun is something that is neither good nor bad, but sometimes each. Um, so if you're killing an animal to eat it, it's good. If you're killing a, a, a attacker uh, to defend yourself, good. If you're killing someone... So who's that innocent, right, that. Um, but money, if you want to zoom out and say, what's its basic function? Mm -hmm. Its basic function is to enable production and trade. And production and trade is as such good. Not or that's it's the thing. A hyper-consumerist society that has no regard for... In this age of spin, I understand in her time, during the Depression, mm -hmm. you have to look at the context of where the book was written. Mm -hmm. But if you apply it to the century of spin now, then there's organizations that have no regard for moral life mm -hmm. and still make mm -hmm. billions of people's backs illegally, mm -hmm. immorally. That is, yes, I'm not even considering it. I agree with you. That, that's I why think, I state his opinion. I think we need to categorically reject the notion that money is evil. I don't think anybody believes that. I don't think, that. That. I don't right. think it's a tool. Like or online believes. So the question is, so is my it... My question was, why does he assert that it's I think we're, we're all rejecting that it's evil. Right. The question is, is it strictly neutral? Or is there respect in which it, and we all agree that it can be used well or badly. So the question is, is it strictly neutral and just can be used well or badly, or is there a, a sense in which sort of at root it's good but can be perverted? And the latter view is the view that Francisco takes in the speech, whether or not it's the view that we end up agreeing on. I think we all agree on that. I don't think anybody not only believes that money is evil, I think we all believe that money is good because it brings us out of barter, which is the Dark Ages among other things. And, and we need to dispense with the notion that, that uh, you know, that the Bible or any of the, contra the actual controversies are, you know, the, the only ones that aren't straw men are talking about the love of money, greed. And there's mm -hmm. three sources of greed. If you want it, if you want somebody else's for yourself, maybe you're 
uh, Karl Marx, a communist who wants a 100% property tax because he thinks mm -hmm. the Queen's too wealthy and, and you know, write a book about it and then yeah. who knows what could happen at that point. Well, simply know. one of the things about money is that it can make greed more covert because people, uh, people in general won't see how much you're accumulating. Okay. I, if you're bar, Tom you had have wanted have to, uh, yeah, yeah right, Tom, so, come in. Okay. It seems that I think the reason why I think that the, 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 the point about guns works for me, uh, contrary to what you're saying, uh, is that I think that if you think of money, I always think one way of thinking it's a form of stored energy. Um, it's a, it, the, the production that has gone into the, and, and, the tr and the trade and the value for value that it embodies means that if you, the money that is absent of government debauchment of the, of the value of money, which is a separate topic we might come on to. Is it's not it, absent of a, the fiat money system that we have. Um, it, that money should be and could be like a like a representation of a story, almost like a storage of all of the the, the work and production, the skill and and, and the, the character that uh, has gone into to, to, to giving you the value in your pocket to to then exchange for something else. And I think in some ways that that, that isn't really. Um, it's not like the same as having a, a firearm where you, where you can only use it to uh, defend yourself against a thug or you go and shoot somebody uh, for no reason. It's, uh, I don't think it's, it, it's, it doesn't quite work in the same way. Um, you know, m money is not something that, um, absent of a coercive political order, I can use to you know, do the equivalent of killing someone with it. I mean, I can't, you can't kill someone with money. Yes, you, you know, let me finish. Uh, you, you talk about uh, yeah, you, you can't kill someone with money. You can obviously buy. You could buy a gun with it to go and kill someone with money. But then, of course, the point is that you're using you're using a resource that you have um, to obtain something for immoral ends. But the actual the, the actual thing that money is itself, um, as a, as a sort of like a storage of of the, of the productive value that you produce, that you have, is not it. It can't. It doesn't fall into the same category. Can I, can I try and like add? Well, to let me, let me, yeah, let me hear your point and then, then let's so move on. I think perhaps, house. perhaps a way to, uh, to put your argument uh, or, or help it or perhaps give a different argument is something like with a gun, once you have it, you know, you can shoot the thug or you can shoot your sort of best friend. Once you, but, but, um, so, so basically, yeah, once, once you've got it, you can use it for all sorts of evil purposes. Um, but with, with money, let's say, you can use it for evil purposes or good purposes once you have it. But prior to having it, someone has to produce something that someone else values. Yeah. Mm. And that production is a sort of a, a bedrock That's kind a good of thing. good thing. And then once you have it, you, you may get plus or minus, but there's a plus at the start. Uh, yeah, that, that might be one way of putting it. And the essential use of it, right? So think about a situation in which you're doing something by means of money that you might have done by other means. So you want somebody to do something for you. We'll hold off the question of whether the thing you want him to do for you is good or bad. Maybe it's you want him to assassinate someone, or maybe it's you want him to plant wheat or something. But uh, if we zoom in on the, the use of money, is the use of money is you're going to get someone to do something for you. And how do you get someone to do something for you? You either offer him money for it, or something that can be exchanged for money for it, that is, you offer him a trade for it, uh, in which case you're dealing with his mind, with his consent, with his decision, and trying to show him it's good for him and trying to make it good for him to do it. Or you try to get him to do it by some kind of, well, what are the other options? Either you try to force him, coerce him into doing it, and that's a sense in which money and force are opposites, right? Or you try to guilt trip him or beg him into doing it where you try to persuade him to do it for some reason other than that um, you'll compensate him or make it worth his while to do it. And that's, that's I think, how Francisco sees the alternative. There's, you're either dealing with people by trade, which money is the means of. Money is a tool of trading. Or you're dealing with people by means of what he calls mooching or looting. And mooching is just, you know, oh, come on, please, you're going to, I feel so, you know, you're begging, basically. Um, and not begging in a way where you're saying, I'll somehow make it worth it for you, but even though it will hurt you to do this, even though you'll get nothing out of doing this, do it for me because I'm so pathetic. Or you're looting, you're taking, you're stealing from people, uh, or otherwise forcing them to do it. 
And if you, you think that there's a distinction between these three ways of dealing with people, and then that money is the means and tool of one of these three ways, and one of these three ways is good and the other two are bad, um, you're going to think that what money essentially is is a kind of feature of a good way of life as contrasted to the other two. But I think to capitalize on some of the kind of ideas we're, we're, we're getting about the neutrality of money and that it can be used badly or well, it would help to, to see if we think that these points are the same or different from the points that Francisco makes when he talks about money being a tool. So he says it's only a tool. It will take you wherever you wish, but it will not replace you as the driver. It will give you the means for the satisfaction of your desires, uh, but it will not provide you with desires. Money is the scourge of the men who attempt to reverse the law of causality, the men who seek to replace the mind by seizing the products of the mind. And this is uh, on page 411 of that. Let's show much of pages in the pamphlet we have of it. Um, and it talks about it won't purchase happiness for the man who doesn't have any concept of what he wants, and so forth. So, there's this... <coughs> I can't see the chat, but Ben is saying that Robert's posted an interesting quote from Marx. Ben, would you read it to me and I'll repeat it? Okay, so there's a... I see. I, I can't see it. Oh, ben, would you text it to the phone that I've called you from? Um, okay, so uh, hopefully I'll get a copy of this interesting quote from Marx that... that uh, has been posted to the chat that's apparently germane to what we're talking about, but which I can't see because of technological difficulties. Um, what was I saying? Well, yes, so there's this idea that Francisco has of money is only a tool, uh, in, in he thinks a tool of a essentially good type of interaction, but it won't replace you as the, the director or the driver. And he thinks that these kind of types of things that he considers misuses of money anyway all amount to some type of attempting to reverse the law of causality. There, there's... Um, I'll just read another paragraph, because I think it, it, it's a little hard to get one's head around this point. Money will not purchase happiness for the man who has no concept of what he wants. Money will not give him a code of values if he's evaded the knowledge of what to value. And it will not provide him with a purpose if he's evaded the choice of what to seek. Money will not buy intelligence for the fool or admiration for the coward or respect for the incompetent. The man who attempts to purchase the brains of his superiors to serve him with his money replacing his judgment ends up by becoming the victim of his inferiors. The men of intelligence desert him, but the cheats and frauds come flocking to him, drawn by a law which he has not discovered, that no man may be smaller than his money. Is this the reason why you call it evil? And skipping a little bit where he's talking about why you shouldn't envy a worthless heir. Um, uh, money is a living power that dies without its root. Money will not serve the mind that cannot match it. So there's this idea that money is, as Tom put a store of energy. But... It's not original thought. I'm sure I've heard it but you've you've it's origin you've originated in this room anyway. You've brought it. You've brought it to us here. So this idea that money is a store of energy, but it's also we get, and I think that's right. And we also get from the speech though that it's a store of energy that's kind of contingent on that energy being somewhere in the world still, right? So no matter how much stuff people produce, if all the productive people die, then we're back to the cavemen with the stack of gold. Um, money, to, to have money, right, for the money to continue to be a store of energy, it has to be that there are people who are still active that will accept the money in exchange for their work. So it's a store of energy that is, un, is not detachable from there being continued activity of that but sort in the world. Continue the, 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 sort of the metaphor, if you like, is that money uh, is a store of energy rather than the same way that electricity needs to have a, a network. Mm -hmm. money is a By definition, you, you need to have 
you know, you need to have a network. And it's almost a bit like with, with language or law, is that it becomes more valuable the more people understand and use it, because by definition, it's a bit like with certain, like even computer software or other kind of networks, is that the more people are involved in it and understand it, the more valuable it is to have it. Right. Uh, whereas if you are the, you know, the, the Robinson Crusoe, there's no point having any money. Right. San Francisco is now making. I actually agree with you. It's called Metcalf's Law. Metcalf's Law? Metcalf. The guy who invented Ethernet. Mm -hmm. He was the first to the uh, to um, write a formula for the network effect and the value of things being connected to each other. Is, uh, Metcalf. Uh, I don't know what his first name is. Robert Metcalf? But there is a. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, my time at this point. Um, mention Isabel Patterson's uh, book. Yes, I think that's um, actually because, very germane. Yeah, uh, because um, her first chapter is about the energy circuit in the ancient world, and for people who want to understand what the energy circuit is, it's a wonderful chapter. This is the book, um, so what's your, um, your first name? Anthony. Anthony is recommending uh, Isabel Patterson's book, God in the Machine. Um, that's the t I've got the title the, right, right? She was a friend of Brandon a long time. Ago. Yeah. The, the god of the machine. The, the god of the machine, sorry, thank you. Um, she calls money frozen energy, I think. It's, it's yeah, exciting. and Patterson calls, she's, we're, um, you know, she calls it frozen energy. And Patterson was a friend of Rand, and I think an influence on her, particularly on these kind of economic uh, points, um, and some philosophical points. So I definitely think she's... Um, a factor in Rand's thinking on some of this, and you can see, you can see that she was writing that book around the time Rand was writing *The Fountainhead*, and um, they had something of a of falling out later than that. But she continued to be a, a big admirer of Patterson's work, and Rand wrote an introduction, I think, to um, to a, or a, either a review or a review introduction, I forget which, um, for the book, which you can get her perspective on what's. Uh, What's significant about it? I think it's in the objectivist it's published. Yeah. So uh, essentially, money is basically both the result of productivity and production uh -huh. in the first instance, and then it's also the promise of future production uh -huh. when you go to trade it to someone, when you offer it to someone for a service. Yes. Yeah, that's both things. But now Francisco is making some additional point that money depends, the value to you of money depends on um, productivity and rationality. Now we can see why it would depend on there being productivity and rationality in the world. If no one was being productive and rational, what could you do with the money? But Francisco seems to think it depends on the value to you of your money. Depends on your own rationality. That if you're if you don't have the mind to match your fortune the fortune won't serve you. Um, any thoughts on this point? Uh, yeah. I just think, um, for me, money is stored um, effort, commitment, sacrifice, uh -huh. but it also buys wealth, and wealth and money is used interchangeably. Okay. But, um, let's, uh, let's, we'll take that. It's actually... Oh, I'm saying to first. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess I have sort of uh, three thoughts on this. First of all, I very much agree about the idea that money won't, pur won't pur purchase a purpose. Like you, can't, uh -huh. you can't buy yourself a sort of, some sort of philosophical, rational sort of end of what you want via money. I, I do disagree about money not buying intelligence for the fool, admiration for the coward, respect uh -huh. for the competence. And if you look at society more generally, I'm sure everyone can sort of imagine individuals they, who they who, I think are, are even incompetents or sort of cowards or fools, Donald Trump, etc. Um, who, who, who's, where, where money is sort of bought, uh, bought admiration, respect, and various other things for them. Uh, and then finally, I, I think mean, the question money, as to whether it's really bought I, those I, I, things. But go ahead. I'm sorry, Please, I think it's a bit long, but I promise I'll no, sort of go ahead. afterwards. Um, and then also, I think just like the force of a sort of boulder rolling down a hill has a kind of inertia, and perhaps as it's going down, uh -huh. it picks up speed and goes faster and faster. So too, the sort of energy within money, you know, uh, sort of, in a way, it generates more energy. Like, you invest money in capital, capital produces money, you invest that money in capital, capital uh -huh. produces more money, etc., etc. Uh, you know, this is perhaps a Thomas Piketty, sort of Marxist, Marxist kind of point. Um, but I still think, you know, that there's a good logic there. 
Um, and, and so as a result, so long as you have enough money, it can be its kind of own safety net for your inadequacies. Hold on, um, Ben, are we still, we're, we're still live, right? <coughs> okay, I just, my, my, my thing looked weird for a minute, so I wanted to make sure the signal can get disrupted. Um, yeah, so there's a, a, qu a question as to um, what is happening in these cases. I mean, certainly, I, I don't want to use Trump too much as an example because it's going to become controversial, uh, um, maybe more so in the he's, states he's, than he's here. But he's no Marxist. He wants a 100% uh, Marxist wants 100 uh, property tax. Right. They want to take everything and give it to Hunter. The uh, socialists want to make income tax more progressive. It's a far, far way to go. But I do agree with you. When Rand wrote that money will not buy knowledge for the uh -huh. fool, the tuition in New York State was about one three hundredth at the public universities what it is mm -hmm. today. So I think that there's a very profound problem with saying money will not buy knowledge for the fool. Tuition is what it is. Okay, so here, I, here we are, back at the Angel Pub, and the discussion's been spirited as we, uh, as we uh, tried to get the internet back up. Um, we were talking about whether intelligence, whether money could buy intelligence for the fool. Um, I, when we were, were broken off, I was making the point that although it's true, and some other people have made this point in here as well since then, that, that it, it's true that college prices have riv risen dramatically. It's also true that other form, uh, sources of information, internet and uh, books and so forth, have become much more accessible. Um, but somebody really stressed, and I forget who from this side of the room, that the point wasn't that money can't buy information or even knowledge for the fool, but can't buy intelligence for the fool. Intelligence being something like the, you know, ability to think. Um, I wanted to make an, an observation about this this point um, about uh, money can't replace you as the driver, connected to this uh, money is a store of energy kind of point, this Isabel Patterson-like uh, perspective on it that I, I think it's right that we're getting in the money speech. And that is, um, it's, a, it's a view that goes back to Plato, um, is definitely in Aristotle, is in, in Thomas Aquinas, um, Aquinas put it, um, it's better for a blind ass that it be slow. Um, that, that is, that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of things that in, in a sense are virtues or positive things like speed, but that they're only positive things in the, in the, um, hands of a directing mechanism that can direct them well, and that is intelligence, virtue, wisdom, and exactly what it is the different philosophers uh, disagree on. Plato thought it was virtue or wisdom at different times, um, or that these were the same, and that was, you know, is a big issue in the Platonic dialogue. And I think that if, if we think of money as something that enables you to take a lot of actions, it's energy that you can unleash in different directions, um, then that means um, that it will be, whether it, it does you serves you well or serves you ill will depend on whether you make the right choices of how to use it. I think there's a lot to to think about about the specific claims Francisco makes, particularly in light of um, of the many seeming counterexamples of people who seem like they get away with quite a lot because they're rich, um, at least for a long time. There's a question as to what the, whether they're really accomplishing anything that brings them happiness uh, in that way, but um, I think they're difficult questions. And in the interest of of time, I want to kind of sort of note them and just mention two or three other points in the speech and see if people have thoughts they want to share on on those. Um, uh, uh, Colton is saying the sounds much better when I'm doing. Now I'm just holding my phone and looking into it. Um, so uh, I was using this complicated device before that I had tethered to the phone. Now I'm just uh, doing it the simple old-fashioned way. Um, the old, the old-fashioned way with an iPhone 10. Yes, and it's it's cameras that can make me look like a talking animal if I put them on. Um, yes. It's interesting what counts as old-fashioned ones, uh, uh, how in one's thinking. I once had um, 
we were moving house and there was an issue of um, when the internet would get installed, the broadband, and we might have been without it for a two, two days and I caught myself having the thought that we might have to live without the internet for two days, like an animal. <laughs> and, um, so there you go. Um, luckily, we were able to avoid that and we were able to retain our human status throughout. Um, so... One of the points Francisco goes on to discuss is uh, what happens to a society when um, money starts being misused or when, um, uh, how does he put it, Um, when you've made evil the means of survival, don't expect men to maintain maintain good, do not expect them to pay more. uh, So when society is set up, so that money is flowing not to the achieving people, but to, um, but to, uh, you need permission to produce and to achieve from people who produce nothing. I, I think let's, I just want to name that point as a significant point in the speech. Um, there's one other significant one I want to, to bring up, or, uh, but before we do that, the, you've made a point a few times now that we've not really addressed which is that um, it's the love of money that's the relevant fact, that is greed. And it's a, um, if we want to take the view that Francisco is responding to in its most serious form, it's the view that there's um, a common problem, which is a kind of uh, pathological and... Well, why don't you put the view as, well, as you think I, I, I believe that there are five ways to say moral judgments about greed. Uh, uh-huh. if you're, if we talked about the priest who wants his parishioners to pay for his um, perpetuation of religion. I think that's a bad way of saying greed is, is bad, and that does appear in almost all religious texts. We can have uh, the envious uh, person who goes off and writes screeds against the rich and starts wars and famines, uh, like Marx, for example. You can have um, the... Uh, Economist who says that greed is good because it brought us out of the uh, uh, barter, and mm-hmm. barter was really terrible. And you can have an economist who says, well, there's also concentrations of wealth, and those aren't necessarily the optimal distribution, so maybe it's not so good. And then there's the parent that says, make sure you can pay your bills, make sure you can buy your food. That That's a parent telling every child mm-hmm. that's ever grown up in a, in a loving household that they need to be greedy. Uh-huh. And so I think that's a way of saying greed is good. So it's two to three in favor. Of the five ways. Oh, no, two, two to three in favor of greed is what I'm saying. You know, there's, there's lots of reasons that are valid for saying greed is bad, but there's more reasons for saying it's good. Uh-huh. And, but it's sort of one of those Aristotelian moderation things where if you take it to the extreme, it's not going to be as good as if it's not quite at the extreme. Hey, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, yes, I'd, I'd like to point out that there's a major error going on here. It's a language thing. Go ahead. Um, people are equating the love of money with greed. Uh, love, in objectivist terms, is mm-hmm. one's reaction to one's highest value. Uh-huh. And to love money is to appreciate what an extraordinary invention money is, in the same way as a battery, that an irrational um, talks about the love of money. Uh-huh. He's not talking about anything to do with greed. Well, let's, well, let's, let's say that so, the love of amassing money is probably what the scripture passes. So to. Francisco talks about this love of money point, right? At one point in the speech, he said, did you say it was the love of money that's the root of all evil? And he, um, I'm just trying to pull up where that line is. Page four, second, third paragraph. Um, well, in the, in the pamphlet version. So, does anyone uh, Yeah, someone read, out, read that out if you've got yeah. it. Or did you say it's the love of money that's the root of all evil? To trade your effort is the person who would sell his soul for a nickel who is loudest in proclaiming his hatred of money, and he has good reason to hate it. The lovers of money are willing to work for it, and they know they are able to deserve it. Good. So, we have the idea that to love money, to love a thing is, to, uh, to, we have the idea that to love a thing is to lo- know and love its nature, to love money therefore is to know and love this kind of uh, fact about it being uh, about trade and, um, and production and coming from reason and, um, 
And so a true lover of money recognizes that as the root of money and therefore is willing to work for it. I'm just summarizing the because I don't think it got uh, on the thing. Now, you had made the point that, um, that we want to differentiate that from greed. And I think it, it depends on... Um, greed is one of the words that gets used different ways uh, as just a kind of bibliographic point, so to speak, about um, what would Rand do or what does Rand do. Um, you get a chapter in Atlas Shrugged called The Utopia of Greed, and uh, you get a chapter portraying some negative characters called Anti-Greed. So there are situations in which she's um, tendentiously using even greed as a positive term, but um, I don't think she's kind of on a mission to reclaim greed in the way she is to reclaim the word selfishness. And I think um, it's, not, it's not clear whether th- that we should... Um, either um, it, it's not clear that I agree with you that what she's thinking of as love of money is what's usually meant by greed well, that's what but what the relationship speech. between them is I think is a, is a it's not obvious Go I admit ahead. that it does say that in the speech but I don't buy it I think that if an objectivist loves books the objectivist would rather have a lot of books than one or two really good books with excellent typefaces and the finest binding uh huh I would argue that the objectivist would find the books that he recognizes his soul in. So it doesn't matter about the quantity of books he has, but the quality of how they help him see the world more saliently. I know, I'm sort of more of you. Do you want to come in on this again? Yes. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with using the word greed uh-huh. as a label for the irrational. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, um, the, 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 the love of money, of course, that does need to be explained to most people. Mm-hmm. Um, at meeting after meeting, um, we talk about the confusion of language uh-huh. uh, that makes discussion of these matters incredibly difficult. Yeah, and you guys are having a series of meetings, I gather, on just this issue. Indeed, we are. So I think on just the, the issue of the word greed, I think it's a word that um, I think you could use it for... Um, I mean, this is just a question of what to use it for, and... Um, uh, let's leave that unsettled um, because it's, it's a long question and um, yeah um, talking about greed and selfishness uh-huh. um, if somebody you know, I mean, a lot of people are like this uh, they accumulate loads and loads and loads of wealth uh, of capital of money mm-hmm. but they live very frugal empty lifestyle what do you call it? Um, you'd, Francisco would call it, so, so the question is, what would you call a person who gets a lot of money, it uses it to, to lead an empty it's lifestyle? It's Francisco would call it somebody who's trying to reverse the law of cause and effect. Huh? Francisco, would, in the speech, would call it somebody who's trying to reverse the law of cause and effect. He's trying to use his, if he's not, doesn't have any goal for the money, um, but he's just acquiring it. He's presumably trying to use the accumulating of it or the fact that he has a lot of money to prove something to himself about himself. Um, but that's not what money's really for. And so he's trying to make money give him values or substitute for the fact that he doesn't have values. And that's the kind of person I think he's talking about under the, the section of somebody who uh, is trying to reverse cause and effect. Can I, can I ask you yeah. about the question of someone who lives a fairly modest quote-unquote lifestyle but who has got an enormous bank account. Uh-huh. Something like that. Um, I've never met this big sort of people, but um, <laughs> if, they, if they want my phone number, they can have it. <laughs> um, sorry, it's not me. No. But there is another way of thinking about it, is that for some people, money is just a way of keeping score. It's just uh-huh. like a way... It's like a football manager who puts himself... Sorry, it's usually a he... The purgatory of managing a team year after year after year because they they they, they, they have a greed or a lust for winning. Uh-huh. So the number of trophies they put on the mantelpiece at the end of every season, or the number of goals scored, or whatever other metric you want to use, is their mm-hmm. way of saying this is. And also, it's, it's actually not a it's not a, um, an altruistic thing. This is a very something I want, want to be the best. Uh-huh. And so, for a lot of people. Having a large amount of money is just their way of keeping count of the fact that they've really shot the lights out they this year in terms of what they're doing. Although, yeah. personally, they may, because of whatever particular preferences they have about their lifestyle, they don't particularly want to drive around in the latest Ferrari or that enormous house. 
but and I think they may probably be the sort of now of course you get a certain kind of strange multi-millionaire probably because they've been got at by their PRs or because they've fallen prey to altruistic philosophy which so they make a big deal about giving it all away to charity or they fly coach when they go long distance I hate these people um, or, or, they, or you know, they, they make a big deal about the fact that they you know that they go to charity shops trust me these people do exist uh -huh. um, that you get this kind of strange schizoid approach towards these things. Um, but to be fair, there are people who live relatively modest, quotes and most lifestyles, who have rich as creatures, because it just, but for them, money is just a way of keeping score about what they've done. So, so I think from, it's, from, if you take Steve Jobs would be an example of this, right? Mm. Um, but if you... Definitely. It, he used to wear the same bloody jacket. Right. And, and he, he lived in a pretty small... And, and he lived in a pretty small house. Yes, yeah, so, so a few points about this. Um, you're pointing... I forget your name. Jezza. Jezza is pointing out that for a lot of people, the money can be a buffer zone. They know that they're secure because they have this money. But I think if you're talking about money as keeping score, right, there are two, two different mindsets you could have. One mindset is a mindset of you're doing some productive activity that you love, say, designing new phones and, and electronics since we're doing this on an iPhone now. Um, uh, and part of how you measure whether the activity is really productive and whether it's really working is if it makes money, if the money can be reinvested and feed itself so that the company is like a living creature, if it's growing... And in that sense, you're keeping score and you see part of what you're doing is making money uh, because you're engaged in a life-sustaining activity that you love and you see the profits as a measure of that. Um, that's a very different mindset than um, you don't love what you're doing. You're not interested in what you're making or creating, you but you see your self-worth as a factor of what your bank balance is. Yeah. And I think... Um, if some, we were talking about somebody using money to keep score, we could mean either of those two things. And I think there are both types of people. Um, let me just, because we're almost at the end of how much time we, we take for these broadcasts, mention one other kind of point. And I would actually say I feel kind of weird keeping this camera pointed at me the whole time now that I'm holding it uh, while you guys are talking. But I know some people didn't want to be on camera, so that's why I'm not uh, presuming to point it at you guys. Uh, so that it's not just that I'm a prima donna internet and everyone has to look at my reaction shots to everything. Um, but I'll, I'll do a group shot at the end uh, for people who want to be in it and just to prove that these aren't all voices I've got one person on the side doing. No one here but us checking. Yeah. Um, so there's this issue about America <clears throat> as a country of money which I think is an interesting thing to talk about, particularly in the only session we've done not, uh, not in the States so far. Um, I mean, Francisco talks about, throughout history there have been uh, fortunes always by conquest. This is where he talks about um, wealth being produced by slave labor and not much of it produced that way, but such wealth as there was produced by slave labor. Um, <clears throat> he goes on to talking about the Industrial Revolution and America as a country of money, and there's the claim, um, which claim is, is false as a matter of, of history and linguistics, that the phrase to make money uh, comes from American English, that that combination of, of words had never been used before. It's in, it's in uh, there are examples of it in British English prior to, uh, like going back to the 1500s, and there are examples in other languages, Latin and such, prior. So as a, a historical claim, this isn't true, but it's... Um, you know, it's in a work of fiction and there's some literary license here. So it's the idea that there's something either unique to American or maybe American and British, because it's, you know, the Industrial Revolution starts here, really. But um, uh, American and British society, where there's the idea that money can be made in a sense that wasn't thought prior to that. And I think there is something to this even if the, the point about the language isn't literally true. Yeah, did you want to come in? I just want to say the biggest difference, I suppose, between both cultures is that Britain showed the world how wealth can be ascribed and passed on in a multitude of ways, where America is the beaming example of how it can be achieved. So I guess that's why they would call it the land of money. Okay. Certain. And it's why your earlier point, you know, how we view middle class and bourgeois and 
uh -huh. Americans view it, even though you guys are an oligarch and you don't even know it. At least I infer that that's the case. It's not really okay. a democracy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your campaign finance was so religious. I mean, it's everything. Uh -huh. uh, well, let's. Uh, let's, let's zero sum. I think we yeah. just got point again. I think. Yeah. Some area. Transactions are not zero sum. Thank you. In almost every case. Any, nobody would bother to make a transaction if there wasn't a pretty good chance to. Uh -huh. But is the idea, is that idea that transactions aren't zero-sum somehow new? Um, new to either America or the Industrial Revolution? Okay. Your, your application earlier. Uh -huh. It's why I said money isn't really a thing. It's like society or time. Yes, they had the barter system even in the caveman days. Even if they didn't have anything so, to trade so much as two rational beings at a fire, one of them caught a beast... They're going to share it together. Well, so, but let's time. come to... I want to I wanna kind of focus on this point, though, of is there something new, whether it's new with the United States of America or new with, you know, the British and Scottish Enlightenment and America or the new to the 17th, 18th, 19th century about the idea, some new way in which it's thought that money can be made rather than just amassed. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, mean, I think that there's perhaps a fascinating sort of historical reason why that might be the case with respect to the British, with respect to the Industrial Revolution, uh, which of course encompasses uh -huh. sort of uh, American, uh, American, specifically American experiment and growth as well. Uh, insofar as for the vast majority of human history, like world production and population was relatively flat, uh -huh. technology didn't improve that much, we didn't get much by way of, of, of population growth or productive production growth, and what growth there was sort of bumped along and had peaks and troughs. It was only really at the point of the Industrial Revolution that we get this ridiculous explosion in production, explosion in population. So, so there's clearly, for, clearly for most of history, the sum of wealth was relatively fixed. Uh -huh. Someone else would have to lose wealth. Well, but after the Industrial Revolution, or during the Industrial Revolution, you get to a point where, because the wealth of society is sort of increasing at such a massive rate, pe people from sort of all over society can make trades or make exchanges in which... So we're getting we're getting the idea that if you know you look at like a chart of um, how much wealth there was in the world, it was pretty flat, or at least wealth per capita, I guess, was pretty flat until the Industrial Revolution, and then it skyrocketed. And um, you're saying that before that, if someone got wealth, um, someone else was losing out. So the transactions were zero sum or nearly so. I mean, I I think there's some there's definitely truth to the Industrial Revolution being a, a real game changer. But let me just, I think there's something of a difference between money and wealth in this respect. So every year, um, you know, more corn was grown on the farm. And uh, someone had to work and there was more corn grown than last year and you can get, um, uh, that is not, the, the output was greater, but I mean, you know, we didn't just have last year's corn, now we have this year's too, which then gets consumed. Um, new things can get made, and in some sense, wealth can get added to the world. But uh, there don't seem to have been new fortunes throughout most of history, other than by conquest, right? You could think, you know, of course, some work had to be continuously done on the land for there to be food. But there wasn't new land. Uh, and there wasn't new ways to make types of land that weren't arable before arable, or very seldom did that happen. And there weren't ways to make fortunes. So to be rich, I think, throughout almost all of human history was to have an estate, to have some land. And, uh, and the amount of that, the amount of fortunes didn't change. Those seemed to just change hands. Yeah, you want to come in on this? Uh, yes, first of all, I, I'm glad you drew a distinction between wealth and uh, money, which I think was a suggestion that was made earlier. Uh -huh. uh, and I wanted to come in on that. But um, I'd just like to address the um, uh, rather misconceived idea that uh, trade uh, was a zero-sum game until the Industrial Revolution. It, <laughs> when two people traded in, in, in prehistoric times, they were exchanging things that they wanted less for something that they wanted more. So the sum total of happiness, if you like, was greater at the end of the transaction than before the transaction. Oh, well, so it's, so yeah, it's I agree with, I agree, let me just, because we're, well, lose on this one. because we're running short on time, let me just, uh, let me just uh, 
take a sort of little bit more control over the discussion for the last few minutes of it. Yes, yeah, so I absolutely agree with that, and that was part of why I wanted to draw, to well re bring up that distinction. So I think yeah, even in the early days when there was a trade, assuming that it was a trade that didn't involve we were not talking about a slave trade or something. We're talking about I'll give you weed and you'll no give me right and you'll give me horseshoes or something. Uh, I think there definitely was it was win win and it wasn't zero sum. But those kind of trades, because there were only so many of them and they were only about a fairly limited number of items in a context where there wasn't that much production happening, there weren't many people who got very, very rich through those kind of trades. Um, The people lived by them. Some people did eventually. And eventually we had bankers and merchants and that kind of a bourgeois class that got rich through them. But it was a rare exception and and for the most part, the standard of living of people was relatively flat. It's only with the Industrial Revolution that you started having uh, fortunes made, I think, uh, where, where prior to that, fortunes were primarily an issue of conquest. It was, you know, someone took over someone's land or something. And I think that that is something that's significantly new with um, capitalism. Death. And with... Um, uh, I think primarily in the United States, also in um, England is the other really significant country for this, right? Um, and exactly the relationship between the two. Since you don't we, think feudal fiefdoms were a representative example of amassing huge amounts of localized wealth? The peasants having to deal with the fields were not... So the question is, is our feudal fiefdoms an example of amassing wealth? Uh, they're an example of amassing it, but I mean these fiefdoms remained about as rich as they were for hundreds of years, right? And they didn't, it's, they didn't keep getting richer and richer at a skyrocketing rate, I don't think. Well, I mean, how do you measure that? Is, it, is a fiefdom with a ton of gold worth less than a fiefdom with a ton and a half of gold? I don't know. Um, well, in terms of standard of living, in terms of... Yeah, they, well, they weren't doing a good job of, of maintaining their local standard of living, that's for sure. But, you know, I just want to point out that the, um, the, the idea of zero-sum transactions definitely occurred with the earliest barter. You know, if I had something rich in vitamins and you had something rich in minerals and we trade, then we're both better off. So there's right. definitely... The but non- that it's not zero-sum. Yeah, 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 but that was not recognized, and I have it right here from uh, books.google.com, until about 1965, when the, the term entered the literature... Zero sum and the idea of non zero sum transaction did not even. Well, I mean that that way of that doing. way of phrasing it didn't um, that is zero sum. But I mean I think Adam no, Smith I mean, was. That's an interest. I don't even think Adam Smith. I'm starting on something like that's an interest, interest especially after uh, the industrial revolution. I mean, how do you create more money? Create more money by just putting people in debt. The Americans did it with the General Assembly line in the nineteen twenties. When which. All right, so we are, um, I think we are over really what our time should be for this. Yeah, we're about 10 minutes over. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up for the internet. We might continue chatting about some of these things here uh, at the Angel Pub. And uh, we'll be back online with the Atlas Project um, a week from Tuesday uh, with a proper episode. And I might try to, uh, that's the 28th of November. And I, uh, that where we'll be talking about Book Two, Chapter Two, the chapter in which his money speech occurs, and if possible, uh, Ben or I might go on some or one or both of us sometime before then to chat about other, uh, you know, in more supplemental episodes. We'll see if we have the ability to do that. So I want to thank uh, everyone for watching and thank everyone here. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna just pan around so we can see people. If you don't want to be in the shot, just um, well. Where do, where do people? I know you. I know you didn't want to be in the shot. Is there anyone else who wants to not be on the internet? Yeah. Just so. Here we go. We've got a a pub full of people here. Um, pub full of people drinking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who would have thought to stop? Okay. Well, thanks everyone, and I'll uh, see all you guys um, in New York back on the twenty eighth. Bye bye. Thanks everyone here.